Nancy Perry Baird was born January 14, 1952. She had a four-year-old son that lived with relatives and also had an ex-husband who lived in Wyoming. On July 4, 1975, 23-year-old Nancy was working at the FINA gas station at 1378 North Highway 89 in East Layton, Utah. A police officer on patrol saw her working alone around 5.15 p.m. When the manager arrived 15 minutes later to take over her shift, she was no longer there and considered missing. There was no evidence of robbery and no indications of a struggle, but about $10 worth of gas from the station's pumps had not been paid for. Her car was found locked and parked in the parking lot where she had left it. Her car keys, purse containing her medications, and $167 cash from a recently cashed check were found in the car. It's considered highly unlikely that she would have left of her own free will. Just before her disappearance, witnesses saw a truck at the gas station. It was never identified and it's unclear whether it had anything to do with her disappearance. Investigators questioned her ex-husband, but he had been out of state at the time she disappeared and passed polygraph exams. Authorities initially assumed that Nancy was one of the many victims of the serial killer Ted Bundy. Therefore, many people were not interviewed because the investigation focused on Bundy only. Bundy would confess to killing over 30 women and young girls in many states, including Utah, between 1973 and 1978, but he never confessed to Nancy's death. While he was attending law school in Salt Lake City in 1975, he specifically denied killing Nancy during his death row confessions. Also, her abduction doesn't fit the profile of his other crimes. For starters, Bundy never drove a truck and Nancy was the only possible victim of his that was abducted from a gas station, plus he preferred dark-haired women and Nancy was strawberry blonde. As of late, a new theory has developed and there are two other persons of interest in her case one of whom wanted to date Nancy, drove a truck, and was later imprisoned for sex offenses and other crimes. He is still currently in prison, and due to COVID-19, investigators have been unable to interview him as of March 2021. There are no details available on the other person of interest, and investigators have not released the names of the two men. As of today, Nancy remains missing and the case unsolved. Lloyd Michael Reese was born June 14, 1971 and lived in Salt Lake City, Utah. In the summer of 1985, he had just graduated from Glendale Middle School and was about to turn 14 years old. On June 3, 1985, he shared a candy bar with his younger brother and sister and then left his home at 173 East 1700 South. He would leave with his older friend, 21-year-old David Jaramillo, and two other friends to go boating at the East Canyon Reservoir. At some point during the day, David and Lloyd became separated from their other two friends. They were last seen driving away in a brown Datsun B210. They were reported missing by friends and family members after they failed to return home that evening. Authorities stated they had little evidence in David and Lloyd's disappearance and aren't sure if they met with an accident or foul play. The two friends who were with David and Lloyd are not considered suspects in the case. David was working with his father at the New Grand Hotel in Salt Lake at the time he went missing and he had plans to attend Salt Lake Community College in the fall. In 2010, David's brother and mother met Lloyd's family for the first time. Also in 2010, David's family placed a headstone in a local cemetery, and then weeks later, the police reopened the investigation. In 2020, the Utah Cold Case Coalition and a team of volunteers from Utah State University were planning to probe the bottom of the reservoir with an underground camera. But to date, the vehicle David and Lloyd were in has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Joseph Michael Bushling was born on June 3, 1984, and nicknamed Joe. He was born and raised in California and moved with his family to Russellville, Arkansas in 2000. 
Joe joined the Army where he eventually became an Army Specialist and was deployed to South Korea. In May 2011, at the age of 26, he was assigned to Fort Collins, Colorado and was stationed at the Army base in Dugway, Utah. He had recently divorced and lost his younger brother, Jeremy, to suicide in March 2010. He was looking forward to an upcoming reassignment to San Antonio, Texas. While in Utah, he worked as an emergency medical technician and ambulance driver at Dugway's Medical Clinic. On May 8, 2011, he left the English Village area early in the morning and drove out into the desert in a black Mitsubishi Lancer he had borrowed. At 7 p.m. that evening on May 8, he called a friend in Dugway and left a message saying he had run out of gas and was on the west side of Granite Mountain. When he placed this call, it pinged off the Dugway base. He said he was going to try to walk back to the Dugway Proving Ground. He also said it was very cold and rainy and that he had lost his flip-flops and was having to use his shirt as footwear and desperately needed help. The Dugway Proving Ground, where he was supposedly heading, was established by President Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1942 to study chemical and biological warfare and covers nearly 800,000 acres in the desert along the Nevada border. Joe went missing on Mother's Day and has never been heard from again. Six days later, the car he had been driving was found abandoned in a deep ravine off a gravel road in a very isolated area about 60 miles from Dugway's main gate. Some of Joe's belongings were inside the vehicle, but the keys were missing and there weren't any clues to indicate his whereabouts. Two days later, Joe's Arkansas Razorbacks hat was located in the desert six miles from the car and searchers found his flip-flops. The terrain where he disappeared is rough and desolate, with lots of caves, and cell phone reception is very poor. After his disappearance, the Army automatically classified him as a deserter, although his supervisor didn't believe he had actually deserted. His family doesn't think he left of his own accord either. They stated he was happy in the Army and was close to his parents. He had no history of mental illness, and nothing was missing from his room. Authorities have ruled out suicide and foul play as possible explanations for Joe's disappearance. A death certificate was issued for him in August 2014 and the cause of death was given as exposure due to low temperatures and lack of protective clothing. His family held a memorial service for him and because the Army had changed his status from a deserter to a deceased person, a six-man honor guard was present at the service. Several searches of the rough and desolate desert and area caves have been searched and unmanned drones and helicopters have flown over looking for Joe, but nothing was ever found. His family has hopes that his body will be located one day and put to rest. However, as of today, he has never been found and this case remains unsolved. Justin Hoyman was born on December 7, 1989, and has two older sisters and a brother. He lived in Salt Lake City, Utah, and enjoyed soccer and reading and was very close to his family. When he was five years old, his father, who was abusive to the family, had committed suicide. When he was 17, he had to have surgery for an injury and was prescribed Oxycontin. This led to him becoming addicted to narcotics, and he also began mixing alcohol with them. He then lost his adoptive stepfather, and he became addicted to harder drugs at that point. He was later ordered by the court to go to rehab and was non-compliant, so he was jailed. He would later be imprisoned for a crime, but released in the summer of 2017. Months later, on November 20, 2017, when he was 27 years old, he was staying at the Fortitude Treatment Center, a halfway house for male parolees. He spoke to his mother, Marilyn, that morning on his way to work and made plans for them to have lunch together, but he never showed up. She had called him right back to see where he wanted to meet for lunch, but he did not answer. He never made it to work and has never been heard from again. It's uncharacteristic of Justin to leave without warning, and he was reportedly having some problems with unspecified men that were also at the Fortitude Treatment Center at the time of his disappearance. 
His loved ones say that the investigators in his case have not had any urgency in solving his case because of his lifestyle and assumed he was on the run from legal issues. It was several years before the investigators looked into his phone records. His family says that Justin would never leave and not stay in contact with his family for any reason. The halfway house, which was later closed down, was not helpful in providing any information and it was months before his belongings were given to his family. This video is the last time his family saw him. As of today, this case remains unsolved. Acacia Patience Bishop was born October 29, 2001 to Casey and Adam. On May 25, 2003, Acacia was less than two years old when she was at her great-grandparents' home in Salt Lake City, Utah. Her parents were at a wedding rehearsal and asked her great-grandparents to babysit. Also at her great-grandparents' home was her 38-year-old grandmother, Kelly Lodmail. Kelly had chronic severe mental illness, including paranoid schizophrenia with grandiose delusions, psychosis, and bipolar disorder, a history of drug abuse, and violence. However, she was in denial of her mental illnesses and failed to comply with court-ordered treatments. She had also been very possessive over Acacia, and all these things caused a strained relationship with her daughter Casey, Acacia's mother. Kelly had taken Acacia without permission in the past and hid her in a man's apartment located in the basement of an apartment where she was staying. She had told Casey that Acacia was hers and she wasn't going to give her back. So on this day in May of 2003, Kelly was on supervised visitation with Acacia at Kelly's parents' home. Acacia's great-grandmother Linda was the supervisor for the visit. But when Linda left the room for a moment to return a vacuum cleaner, Kelly came inside from working in the yard and took Acacia. The next time they were seen was the next day in Idaho Falls, Idaho. They were close to the Broadway overpass and Greenbelt next to the Snake River dangling their feet in the water. Soon after, Kelly, soaking wet, ran into a nearby hydroelectric plant near the overpass and told employees that she had dropped her baby into the river while they were dangling their feet off the bridge. The plant was immediately shut down so Acacia would not get sucked into its turbines. Divers searched the murky river for several days, but Acacia was not found. However, a pair of baby shoes and a doll were found on the riverbank. One of Kelly's shoes was also found on the bank, the other one was in the water. Authorities believe Acacia drowned in the Snake River and have classified her case as a homicide. They do not feel like Acacia accidentally fell into the river. The police believe she intentionally jumped in the water with Acacia in her arms in a murder-suicide attempt. She would eventually admit this to authorities and was charged with kidnapping and murdering. She stated that she believed the baby made it out of the water and is still alive somewhere. Kelly has a criminal record including drunk driving, threats with a dangerous weapon, disorderly conduct, domestic violence, drug possession, and she spent two months in jail for shooting an 11-year-old girl in the legs with a pellet gun and told police she enjoyed it. She was usually homeless and lived on the streets or her car. She was non-compliant with her medications and could not usually afford them. She was not taking her meds at the time she abducted Acacia. Acacia's parents state that Kelly is a known habitual liar and hope that she is lying about what happened to Acacia in an effort to conceal her from the rest of the family and hope that she passed Acacia over to one of her friends and plans to find her after she is released from prison. Acacia's parents say Kelly has never had suicidal tendencies before and had never indicated that she might harm her. They also suggested her confession of murder was fabricated and that she might have been planning Acacia's abduction for months. Police investigated the possibility that Kelly gave or sold Acacia. Acacia's parents believe that she is still alive. Kelly sent them a letter from jail writing that Acacia was alive and being cared for by others. She never referred to her in the past tense in her letters. They also point out that Kelly purchased diapers and milk for Acacia shortly before she allegedly drowned, which would not make sense if she had been planning to murder her. 
Acacia's mother and father are offering a reward for their daughter's safe return. They have issued a sketch of a man they think may be helping hide Acacia. The sketch was not made by a professional sketch artist and is not endorsed by the police. The man was allegedly seen checking Kelly and Acacia out of the Red Lion Hotel on May 26 prior to the incident. Police detectives do not think the man, if he exists, was involved in Acacia's disappearance and presumed death. Kelly was tried for kidnapping in federal court but was acquitted in 2005 due to insanity. The judge decided Kelly was delusional when she abducted Acacia and believed the baby was in an abusive situation and she had a duty to save her. Kelly was determined to be a danger to the community based on her mental illness, past criminal behavior, and history of violence and substance abuse. She was committed to a mental hospital for an indefinite period. She may be released from the hospital at a later date if psychiatrists determine she is no longer dangerous, but her prognosis is poor as she has repeatedly refused to follow through with treatment programs for her schizophrenia and does not believe she is mentally ill. It is unlikely that Kelly will ever be released from federal custody. Therefore, Idaho prosecutors dropped the murder and kidnapping charges against her. If she is ever released from the hospital, she may face the state charges again. Acacia has never been found, and as of today, this case remains unsolved.